to uh, yeah that's exactly what i meant with the recording uh, i would like to start uh, with a more general uh, topic and um, introductory panel which gives an overview of um, the field investment arbitration and uh, which raises all types of um, questions and you know it, it is a general topic you know for somebody probably who is very specialized and, and already knows uh, so what are the issues what is the situation what are the players but also for those who uh, probably are in the public sector or in the ministries and who are not uh, familiar day-to-day uh, uh, with the issues that are currently being discussed um, on the international uh, forums and um, in the scholarship and, and books. So it's a, a good introduction for all the uh, following panels. And um, I'm very glad to introduce our first speaker, Professor Sorna Raja. Um, who is an um, emeritus professor and um, a very well-known academic um, who uh, was also the supervisor of my dissertation at the National University of Singapore. He's also the author of one of the oldest, uh, probably, and um, one of the first um, 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 critical uh, textbooks on the, on the subject, on the international investment law. Um, he uh, is also an author of a number of other books, um, including um, The Misery of International Law, written together with Margot Salomon and John Linarelli, um, which received the European Society of International Law Book Prize in um, 2019. He is uh, also, um, he was teaching and giving lectures uh, all around the world in prominent universities and research centers. Um, he was head of the law school um, at the uh, University of Tasmania in Australia, and um, he's also an advocate in a number of countries, including Sri Lanka, Singapore, and England and Wales, and uh, was uh, participating in um, a number of leading uh, investment arbitrations from the uh, kind of from from the birth of um, the, the industry of um, the field. So I'm uh, very glad to invite Professor Sorna Raja to give his thoughts um, that uh, uh, on the topic of deflecting change and investment arbitration. Professor Sorna Raja, would you like to start? Yes, uh, thank you so very much, Inga. It's uh, very nice to be able to uh, speak at a conference that you chair. And I thank the University of Vilnius for inviting me to speak at this conference. So my topic is about change in uh, investment arbitration. And it is a change that uh, uh, is occurring at the moment, uh, simply because of the fact that many states, as well as many people in the world, are opposed to the existence of such investment arbitration. As you know, many states have withdrawn, like uh, uh, South Africa, of course, with, terminated all its investment treaties. Uh, some of the Latin American states have withdrawn from investment arbitration. Uh, many treaties have been terminated by countries like India and Indonesia, and new treaties are in vogue. So obviously change is afoot. And uh, when change occurs, there is resistance to such change. After all, the existing law is based upon the fact that there were interests particularly powerful interests like multinational corporations, the home states of multinational corporations, which uh, brought these, uh, uh, this law into being. And we see that the heyday of this law was during the period of the ascendancy of neoliberal thought in the 1990s and uh, the early uh, decade of uh, the 21st century. But there is a visible decay that is taking place now. And uh, I would like to highlight just about three or four of the changes that are being made. I, as I suggested, it, the old law, the law that protects investments, contains uh, inflexible rules 
on investment protection are very tenacious and will not yield to the changes that are taking place. So one strategy that would uh, be adopted by the more powerful entities that want to preserve the law is to ensure that it is deflected into areas of compromise rather than areas in which uh, a full erasure of the law is uh, visible. So one, one symptom of that, of course, is uh, something that probably Colin Brown would talk about, uh, perhaps the, the, the establishment of uh, an investment court, which uh, is uh, something that the European Union uh, puts forward. Uh, I would uh, argue that this again is uh, something that uh, uh, seeks to preserve an existing structure, because in my view, the establishment of an investment court would uh, ensure that uh, the laws relating to the protection of investment property, the laws relating to the protection of foreign investment contracts are enhanced rather than diminished. So what would emerge is not uh, the rather flexible system of investment arbitration, which does not create a hard precedent, but uh, a system in which uh, judges, uh, largely European judges who are trained uh, uh, to follow philosophical traditions of the law that are insistent on the protection of property, the protection of uh, business contracts, they would be making law that would become hard and fast. For this reason, I would su suggest that uh, the focus that exists on uh, uh, the establishment of uh, a multinational or multilateral investment court must be, uh, must be looked upon with uh, a great deal of caution. We should ensure that there are adequate ways in which uh, the precedents that are established uh, by the court can be re-examined by, uh, by mechanisms that uh, adequately reflect the interests of the whole world and the people of the world. The second uh, I, uh, change that I would uh, focus upon is uh, corporate responsibility. Here also, we see that uh, there is uh, so much uh, of emphasis on the protection of uh, the property of the foreign uh, investor, hard and fast inflexible rules that have been formulated for the protection of uh, the foreign investor, enhanced by the building up of arbitral awards that uh, expand considerably, expand considerably the scope of the investment treaties like for example, the uh, fair and equitable uh, treatment standard has been extended well beyond uh, what was imaginable at the time it was first introduced into investment treaties. Uh, the response of course of uh, the developing countries has been to argue for corporate liability. So this argument of course, which goes back uh, to the days of the United Nations transnational cooperation in the 1970s has been sidetracked again by uh, the so-called rugged principles, which seek to bring about uh, soft standards of international law uh, relating to corporate liability. So we have a system where the multinational corporation can bring uh, action against states, but there's no way in which uh, the misdeeds of multinational uh, corporations, their misconduct can be uh, questioned by uh, courts. This uh, system of course is changing. We see, for example, the English courts in uh, uh, cases like uh, Vedanta Resources, the Canadian court uh, in uh, Nevson's case, uh, uh, trying to sort of halt uh, the uh, trend that uh, the parent company of multinational corporations cannot be liable for the harms caused by, uh, by uh, their subsidiaries in uh, other countries. You also see that uh, just last week, the Dutch courts uh, held uh, that Shell would be responsible for not adhering to climate uh, change standards uh, in other countries. So clearly there is uh, an emergence of the notion of corporate uh, responsibility, at least in uh, the domestic courts, which is not reflected in uh, the international law that uh, 
that uh, has developed on investment arbitration. So clearly then there is a need to ensure that, uh, the, uh, that, that there is hard and fast uh, uh, rules on corporate responsibility then be deflected into this channel that the RAGI, so-called RAGI principles uh, indicate of uh, the emergence of soft law uh, and uh, the soft peddling of the notion of corporate responsibility. The third idea that uh, I would like to, uh, to uh, focus on is the uh, notion of, uh, of uh, the so-called uh, uh, so treaties that uh, are supposed to be balanced treaties. So now we see that uh, the treaties that are made, like for example, the Canada European Union Treaty is a balanced treaty. Unlike the old treaties which uh, emphasize investment protection, the so-called balanced treaties uh, do contain the same, virtually the same provisions on investment uh, protection as the old treaties did. But the balance is affected, we are told, because there are exceptions that come, arrive, come about uh, due to the existence of uh, <coughs> the regulatory power in the state to, uh, to, uh, uh, to control uh, harm that uh, could be brought about to public interest in the state. So the balance that is affected is through the recognition of the primacy of investment protection with the provision of defenses uh, to uh, the state on the basis of uh, the violation of human rights by a multinational corporation, the, the violation of environmental standards and uh, the, the failure to, to abide by uh, labor standards. So what we see now then is that there is a proliferation of uh, exceptions or defenses that are created to uh, charges uh, that multinational corporations can bring against states. But my argument relating to these uh, treaties is that they put uh, the, the cart before the horse. I'm sure if you ask a constitutional lawyer of any country, he would say that the most important thing, important reason for constitutional laws is the protection of the public interest. After all, our states are created to protect the public. And that's the rash, rationale for the existence of any state. The idea that there is a, a legislature and an executive, the, the focus of constitutional law and uh, the systems of pu public law is the protection of the public interest. And we were, we, we were reminded of uh, that by Cicero in the old times when he said, salus populi suprema lex, that the highest law is the protection of the public interest. But when you look at an investment treaty, it tells you something entirely different. You must recognize the primacy of the foreign investor. You must protect his investment. And we are told this, that, uh, that uh, this is necessary in order that more flows of foreign investment would take place. And if you're a developing country, <coughs> you can't do without these uh, flows. I think that uh, all the economic idea is coming to be, uh, uh, be flawed by recent studies. And in any event, the fact that there are so many, uh, so extensive damages that are imposed upon developing countries, there are awards, uh, of $6 billion against Nigeria and Pakistan in recent times. And you can't talk in terms of development when you have such huge damages sitting on top of you. So clearly these balanced treaties don't affect the proper balance. You have to put the regulatory interests of the state before the interests of the foreign investor. So if a treaty must be constructed then, it must be constructed in such a way as to recognize the priority or the primacy of the public interest, the right of a state to regulate and provide uh, uh, in exceptional circumstances, that is in circumstances that uh, fall uh, uh, apart from the uh, right to regulate, uh, uh, right, uh, 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 relief must be provided to the foreign investor. So the structuring of a treaty, if the treaty system should exist, should prioritize the right of the state to regulate, providing for exceptional circumstances where that right has been abused by a state. 
So we go back to the old system of international law, of the real customary international law, in which uh, remedies were provided only for denial of justice. Like, for example, in the old cases that uh, the International Court of Justice has decided. So we, uh, so let me summarize because I think I am, uh, I have finished about 12 minutes now. Let me summarize and say that uh, in the context of uh, the present developments in international law, uh, the primacy that is given to the foreign investor must be, uh, must be uh, rescinded altogether, I would say, because here we have uh, a priority of common human interests uh, involved, as well as the interests of uh, particular states. There's an interest in climate change uh, that, uh, that must receive priority over foreign investment, multinational corporations do offend against environmental standards that affect climate change, as uh, the Dutch court uh, uh, stated in the, in the recent decision in the Shell case, then the fact is that the gap between the rich and the poor is broadening so immensely. And whereas in the past there was a gap between the rich and the poorer countries, what is now happening is that there is a gap between the poor of the rich countries and the 1% of the rich of the rich countries. So this is going to be the future problem that has to be addressed. And then, of course, there is uh, uh, COVID, which demonstrates more than anything else the need for common human approaches to problems. So in this context, then, the talking of uh, the continuous harping of the idea that international law is there to protect the interests of just one or two percent of humanity when the rest of humanity is left aside, I think uh, is, uh, is to contribute to the creation of greater misery in the world. So I think that uh, with the emergence of China, we might also see that uh, there would be rethinking being done because we see that uh, the focus of the rich countries is on national security, keeping out uh, the new hegemonic power, China. So clearly then there is uh, a need to rethink the focus uh, of uh, international investment law and uh, ensure that there is uh, a change that is brought about. Thank you so much. Thank you. I will stop there. Thank you. I, I totally agree. Yeah, and I think change I... is uh, constant, and uh, it's fascinating to um, stop and to reflect uh, on uh, moments like this, and to think uh, about broader implications of the system and where does it come from and how it operates and who is affected. And now at this moment, I'm. Uh, very um, happy to invite uh, Professor Yarek Krivoy to make his presentation on the procedural side of investment arbitration. Uh, he's a senior fellow in international economic law and director of investment treaty forum at Bickel. He holds degrees from Harvard, Moscow, Nottingham, Utrecht, and St. Petersburg. He used to practice in uh, many prominent law firms around the world, and he is listed as arbitrator in uh, many institutions. Also, he is the course leader of the Institute's new online course on international investment law and dispute resolution. And um, Yarik, um, please, floor or screen is yours. Labas Ritas. Uh, good morning. Uh, thank you very much for inviting me to this event and congratulations to Inga and Vilnius University on uh, putting it together. I wish I were physically in Vilnius uh, today. Uh, I used to go quite often to Vilnius and, and to Kaunas in the past, but now uh, less so, but hopefully the times will change. And um, my uh, presentation today will take a more comparative approach to uh, investor state dispute settlement. Uh, I will um, put my comparisons in the context of efforts to reform the system of investor state dispute settlement. And uh, essentially, I will talk about three ideal models of adjudication, private adjudication, public adjudication, and hybrid adjudication. So I will examine key procedural and uh, substantive uh, aspects of adjudication to see uh, what sort of lessons we can learn on the basis of this analysis. Uh, 
And the picture which you can see on the first slide is not a coincidence. So essentially it illustrates uh, so the line of my arguments. Uh, on the one side, you see a public adjudication with uh, judges uh, dressed, uh, appointed, uh, and deciding uh, disputes in accordance with public international law. Uh, on the other side, you see private arbitrators who are you know, casually dressed and uh, um, you know, in a room, probably a hotel room, and they apply uh, domestic law. This is commercial arbitration, so this is the private side of education. And in the middle, you see something in between. Uh, you know, the, the, uh, someone who looks, you know, he, he's dressed maybe like a judge, maybe not, uh, and uh, there's another person who is also a member of that tribunal. So this is uh, an exit tribunal, and this is hybrid adjudication. So what uh, my uh, presentation does is um, I will go through procedural and substantive aspects of adjudication to draw some conclusions. Uh, but my starting point is that uh, foreign direct investments are uh, beneficial for states and investors if they're adequately regulated and protected. So the real question is how to adequately regulate and protect them. I'll talk about ownership and funding, appointment and tenure of adjudicators, uh, requirements on diversity of adjudicators, adjudicators background, transparency and confidentiality, applicable law, setting precedents, as well as internal and external uh, review mechanisms. So let us start with ownership. When you look at uh, public adjudication institutions, and I uh, use the International Court of Justice and the European Court, of, or, Court on Human Rights as examples of public adjudication, these institutions are usually owned and funded by states with uh, no or with nominal uh, fees, fees for disputing parties. Right? So it's almost free to access that because it's public paid from uh, taxpayers' uh, pockets. When you look at uh, private uh, adjudication, uh, these institutions uh, are owned and funded by private actors, and they are significant fees for the parties which help those uh, institutions to survive and to, and to prosper. When you look at hybrid adjudication, and I use EXIT as an example of a hybrid adjudication institution, institution uh, is owned by states, funded primarily by fees of parties, but uh, also subsidized by an intergovernmental organization, in this case, uh, the World uh, Bank. Now, let's look at appointment and tenure of adjudicators. In public adjudication, adjudicators or judges are appointed by states, usually for fixed periods of time. Uh, these are status adjudicators. And then uh, if we look at private adjudication, uh, adjudicators are appointed by parties or the institution for each individual case. And they are also uh, known as contractor adjudicators. So there is a contract for each case and uh, an adjudicator is appointed. The hybrid adjudication system, uh, the exit uh, system, follows the private adjudication uh, approach. So essentially, contractual adjudicators rather than judges appointed uh, for fixed periods of time. Uh, there is also a linkage, uh, or the system of appointment is also linked to requirements uh, for candidates uh, to become judges or arbitrators. If you look at public adjudication, there are rigid requirements on diversity of adjudicators on geographic and developmental level of country of origin. Right? These requirements you can see in the statute of the International Court of Justice. There are also requirements uh, in, the, um, in the procedural documents of the European Court of Human Rights. So in other words, uh, the adjudicators should represent their main uh, constituencies. Private adjudication does not have uh, any uh, requirements of, on diversity of adjudicators. There is nothing about geographical and development level of the country of uh, origin. Uh, but if you look at the actual practice of who, are, of, who, of who actually are appointed as private adjudicators, you can see that the level of diversity is quite high there. People from various countries uh, act as private adjudicators, let's say, at the International Court of Justice, uh, uh, sorry, at the ICC uh, Arbitration Court, or uh, at the Singapore International um, Arbitration Center. And the reason uh, why there is a significant diversity is that because uh, disputes are usually resolved in accordance with national law. So uh, parties appoint people who are familiar with national law to decide uh, disputes. When we look at hybrid adjudication, there are no requirements on diversity of adjudicators on geographical or developmental level or, or the country of uh, origin. Uh, and uh, that uh, in practice led to 
uh, an over representation of uh, adjudicators from specific regions of the world, more specifically uh, Western Europe and, uh, and North America. Now, if we uh, look at the background of adjudicators, uh, in uh, public adjudication, they primarily have background in public law and public service. So let's say they, they served as judges in the past or they were governmental officials. And uh, certainly uh, they're usually public law experts. In uh, private adjudication, not surprisingly, ar adjudicators or arbitrators primarily have private law and private practice background because they resolve a private disputes. When you look at hybrid adjudication here, it is truly hybrid because adjudicators have private law background and, and private uh, or public law background. So there is a diversity from uh, this uh, point uh, of view. Um, another interesting observation is when we look at transparency and confidentiality, public and private adjudication are very different. Uh, in public adjudication, decisions and other procedural documents are published. Uh, in uh, private adjudication, the default rule, or at least it has been for a long time, that uh, all uh, decisions and procedural documents are uh, confidential. And there are exceptions and uh, there are sometimes excerpts published on the basis of decided cases, but the general approach is that a dis, uh, dispute a settlement, a private dispute settlement is confidential. In hybrid adjudication, there is a mixture, although the majority uh, of cases are published and uh, can be uh, accessed uh, free of charge uh, online. Now let's look at applicable law. In uh, public adjudication, disputes are resolved primarily on the basis of public law with open-ended principles playing the most important role. Right, so if you look at the International Court of Justice, at the European Court of Human Rights, uh, very often the, the rules which they, the international law rules which they apply are not very detailed, but there are principles. So the question is how to interpret these principles in a particular context. In private adjudication, there, on the other hand, disputes are resolved primarily on the basis of private national law with uh, uh, open-ended principles playing a less significant role. Although, of course, there are uh, open-ended principles in uh, any uh, legal system. When we look at hybrid adjudication, disputes are resolved on the basis of public and private, national and international law, and open-ended principles play the most important role. For example, um, we uh, heard from Professor Sonraja that uh, the fair and equitable treatment is one of those principles which has been construed uh, you know, in a, not necessarily in a consistent way by different arbitration tribunals. Now let's move to uh, setting precedents. In public adjudication, decisions in earlier cases often serve as guidance for future cases. And if you look at the uh, uh, International Court of Justice statute, for example, uh, decisions of uh, judicial bodies or international courts, uh, they are seen as a subsidiary means of determining international law. Also, those decisions can be used to prove the existence of customer international law or of general uh, principles of law. Um, if you go to private adjudication, their decisions in earlier cases do not serve as guidance for future cases. So essentially, the focus of private adjudication is just to resolve the case at hand rather than to set precedents for future cases. In hybrid adjudication, uh, tribunals uh, follow uh, uh, decisions in earlier cases, or at least they refer to them, uh, but uh, they are not necessarily bound by uh, previous cases. Uh, that leads to a degree of inconsistency. Now, uh, how about internal uh, review mechanisms? In, um, by re review mechanisms, I mean the ability of a panel uh, to review a particular decision and uh, either annul this decision or, or, or change this decision or ask the tribunal to reconsider it. In the International Court of uh, Justice at, and uh, the European Court of uh, Human Rights, uh, there is an internal review mechanism of rendered decisions in limited circumstances. If you look at private adjudication, for example, ICC arbitration, SIAC arbitration, there is no internal review mechanism of uh, rendered decisions. ICC has a review mechanism of draft, uh, of draft awards, but not really of awards which are uh, rendered. In exit, uh, there is an internal review mechanism of rendered decisions in limited circumstances. So from this point of view, hybrid adjudication looks more like uh, public adjudication. How about external review mechanisms? And by external, I mean uh, review by uh, 
uh, let's say, courts, national courts. In public adjudication, uh, decisions cannot be challenged or set aside by uh, domestic courts, right? Because it's uh, an international, this decision is a matter of international public law, and domestic courts usually cannot review uh, such decisions. Uh, on the other hand, in private adjudications, decisions can be challenged and set aside by uh, domestic uh, courts. Uh, hybrid adjudication, at least uh, exit uh, adjudication, uh, follows the public model and decisions cannot be challenged or set aside by uh, domestic courts. So uh, this was a descriptive uh, part of uh, my presentation. And here you can see that public adjudication and private adjudication are quite consistent uh, in many respects, but hybrid adjudication is uh, somewhat in the middle. Sometimes it follows uh, the public model, sometimes it follows the, the private model, sometimes it has its own uh, model. So in many respects, uh, private, uh, sorry, hybrid adjudication is uh, private adjudication essentially, uh, which uh, looks in some respects like uh, public adjudication. So what sort of uh, lessons can we draw for legitimacy and uh, increasing strengthening efficiency of those institutions? By legitimacy, I understand uh, acceptance of an institution as designed and operated in accordance with generally recognized principles of due process. And uh, legitimacy depends on who has established an institution, private or public actors. And uh, I argue that both procedural and substantive aspects matter, although uh, sometimes they are viewed in isolation. So we, we're only focusing on procedural aspects, forgetting about substantive aspects, or we're just focusing on substantive aspects, forgetting that procedural differences can also lead to significant uh, outcome differences. So uh, substantive legitimacy uh, is uh, uh, to have a body of consistent and predictable substantive rules. For example, not amorphous principles, which are uh, interpreted in different manner by different uh, tribunals uh, failing to create legal certainty. By procedural legitimacy, we mean a satisfactory procedure, for example, not uh, excessively expensive or not particularly long. In the context of uh, uh, hybrid adjudication, exit adjudication in particular, uh, it's very important to understand who is deciding disputes because tribunals have uh, a significant uh, degree of discretion how to ap apply a particular principle or standard. And uh, uh, it's, um, this is why it's, in my view, it's unfortunate that the, in hybrid adjudication, there are no uh, requirements to adjudicators about uh, their background and whom they should uh, represent, the regions uh, of the world, for example, or different um, legal uh, traditions. And uh, moreover, in exit arbitration, it's not unusual to have arbitrators without any meaningful exposure to uh, public uh, international law. Which, is, which would be unthinkable, for example, in the context of uh, private uh, uh, adjudication. For example, you would never appoint uh, an, uh, an arbitrator who has no idea about uh, Lithuanian law to decide a dispute governed by Lithuanian law. However, in hybrid adjudication, this is not unusual, um, or at least in my opinion. Uh, also, uh, decisions as a result of uh, uh, rather amorphous principles, which are contra uh, contradictory at times, uh, there is a pressure to just justify publicly available decisions, uh, and that results in a very long and very costly proceedings in the context of a hybrid adjudication. So I think EXIT may wish to learn from public adjudication institution in many ways, uh, for, and uh, one of uh, these ways could be, for example, to have some sort of review uh, mechanisms, uh, or uh, they may also think about offering a legal aid uh, to the party. I can see that my time is up, so I will uh, wrap up uh, with a few arguments about substantive uh, legitimacy. So as I mentioned, uh, hybrid adjudication, uh, similar to private adjudication, has almost ex exclusively focused on settlement of disputes at hand without uh, thinking about uh, future consequences of decisions for other cases. And this is why I think uh, it's uh, important to have an internal mechanism for setting aside fundamentally unfair awards as a result of appeal or other internal review. And we see that within in the context of ICJ and the European Court of uh, Human Rights, yeah, these uh, mechanisms uh, do exist. And uh, also I think that tribunals should do a better job in relying on domestic law if this law is applicable, uh, rather than on just uh, interpreting uh, some rather vague uh, principles because that would help to facilitate a greater uh, legal certainty.
Uh, this is a short overview of the main uh, arguments uh, from my article, uh, which uh, is coming up in the Leiden uh, Journal of International Law. And this draft, uh, yeah, the draft of this article is uh, already available on SSRN. Thank you very much for your attention. and we'll be happy to answer your questions. Thank, thank you, Yarek, very much for your informative comparison. And uh, now I would like to uh, introduce uh, our third speaker, Colin Brown, who is the head of unit of uh, legal aspects of trade and sustainable development and investment in the um, DJ trade of the European Commission. He leads lawyers working on investor state dispute in trade and investment policy of the European Union. Also, he is a head of the EU delegation to UNCE trial working group three, which works on the reform of investment uh, arbitration. Before that, he uh, used to be at the legal service of European Commission, and he is also lecturing um, at the University of Edinburgh and uh, in Athens. Colin will present uh, the work of UNCITRAL and in particular, the idea of multilateral investment court. So as we heard um, a lot of criticism to the system. So one of the solution is the multilateral investment court. Colin, um, please, floor is yours. Um, thank, thank you very much, um, Inga, and thank you um, also to the University of Vilnius for um, organizing this uh, event and for having invited me. Uh, like Yarek, I would have loved to have been able to, to return to Vilnius. Um, I have fond memories from my, my last um, trip there. Um, I want um, to um, make a number of points. I want to make um, and, and touch on, on five um, specific points in talking about um, uh, reform of investor state dispute settlement and um, the INSO trial process. And so I, I want to start by taking a step back and, 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 and looking at why we are talking about reform um, in this way uh, at this moment in time. I want to secondly say uh, a bit about the INSO trial uh, working group um, and give, give you a a flavor of what is happening there. Third, I want to um, focus on what are the issues of concern which are identified by the Institutional Working Group. Fourth, I want to talk about uh, the EU, the ideas of the EU uh, and its member states. And I want to finally, fifthly finish with just a few points on where uh, this goes um, in, into the future. So the first point on um, on you know why are we why are we looking um, at at reform? I think there are, there are two things um, which we need to think about and which we need to keep in mind. So the system of dispute settlement that we have for investment um, treaties um, was essentially designed in the 1950s, 1960s, early 1970s. And the fundamental features of it were settled then. Um, and there, have, of course, have been changes, but they have not fundamentally changed since um, that, that period of time. Um, and I think it's fair to say that the, the people who put the system in place, who developed the system in the 60s uh, and the early 70s, would not, would not have been able to foretell the evolution of the system. They would not have been able to, to foretell that there would be 3,000 or close to 3,000 bilateral investment treaties um, uh, in existence. They would have not been able to have foretell either the very high level of treaty-based arbitration or treaty-based dispute settlement rather than contract uh, concession-based um, um, dispute settlement. The other thing that I think is important to think about, uh, and here I I would uh, take a slightly different position from Professor Sonraja, um, is the, the, why is there a controversy also around investor state dispute settlement? Because if you look at the rules in investor state disputes, in, in investment treaties, these are rules which we find in many different places. So you have the non-discrimination rules, which you will find in 
uh, domestic constitutions, you will find them in regional systems like the European Convention on Human Rights, you find them in international trade um, treaties. If you look at the protection of property, that is also something that you find in constitutions, that you find in regional systems of protection of, of human rights. And in all of these, um, all, all these rules exist in these very uh, large number of different uh, surroundings, but are largely speaking not controversial. Um, and uh, in, in our view, there's a question about why these rules are controversial in the context of investment, but are not controversial in other circumstances. And in our, in our view, that is linked very much to the system of dispute settlement and the, the dysfunctions, if I can put it that way, uh, of, the, of the system of dispute settlement. And when we, when we look at the system of dispute settlement, we, we think you need to keep in mind two different perspectives of looking at it. One is the, the general perspective, the perspective of um, uh, general politicians, the, the man or woman in the street, um, who, um, and, and this is important because politicians are asked to vote and to approve treaties that have these features um, and are asked in some cases to allocate budgetary resources to paying awards, managing defenses, um, to, to litigation um, under the system. And so it's important that there is a sense of legitimacy in the system that is held by this kind of general um, level of, of the public. And then I think there's a second level, and that second level is the one that plays itself out a bit more in the UNCITRAL process, which is, is more technical, but is the, the, the policy makers at government level um, and in the, the larger investment community looking at the system and trying to determine how that it can be improved to meet these, um, the, these goals. These, these general political legitimacy concerns. And that takes me, I think, to the second point, and, and that is just to say a couple of words about, about UNCITRAL. So UNCITRAL, as uh, some of you or many of you will, will know, is a United Nations body. It's the United Nations Commission on International um, uh, Trade Law. Um, and it has set up a working group as of 2017 with um, a view to looking at reform of investor state dispute settlement and developing reforms. And these reforms, once they're developed in the Institral Working Group, will eventually be approved by the United Nations General um, Assembly. And uh, our view is that this working group is extremely important because it is literally the first time in the history of the investment regime that you have countries from different parts of the world in the same room. It used to be physically in the same room, now it's just unfortunately <laughs> virtually in the same room. Um, in the same room, debating the rules around at the moment and um, focusing on investment uh, dispute settlement. And that is not something that has happened before. It's not how the regime originated. It did not originate in this kind of multilateral discussion about what is the best approach or what are the best approaches to um, investor state um, dispute settlement. And so we think this process is extremely important and extremely valuable and it has its imperfections, it has many things that one, one might like to, to um, adjust. But it is the place where if there is an effort at develop, if there will be changes to the rules, it will be developed and come out of um, the trial um, process. And the process is, is, is very um, in, um, important in and of itself. We function in the United Nations. The, the working group is transparent. There are many observers that take part. The, um, the reports are made available very quickly. There are audio recordings, there are video recordings. Um, it, it is something which the process itself lends a certain amount of legitimacy um, to, to the reform discussions. And the third point I wanted to touch on is what are the reforms, um, sorry, what are the issues of concern which have been identified uh, uh, in, in the Trump working group? Uh, and that is how the working group has started. It started by saying, well, what are we concerned about? And 
the, the working group has identified three groups of issues um, to kind of focus um, its, its attention and where it, where it views problems. The first is the issues around uh, consistency and correctness. And that, of course, comes from the, um, the ad hoc nature of the current system, where um, whilst one tribunal might decide one thing, the next tribunal may decide something different. And there is no system, no, no real system um, of, of appeal. The second concern arises around arbitrators and decision makers, some of the things that we've, we've, we've heard from, from previous speakers. Um, and, and that is in part about the, the legitimacy of applying an ad hoc arbitration system to the settlement of major public law um, issues. But it is also about the, the lack of diversity, the lack of uh, both gender diversity and um, geographic diversity um, in decision making. And the third area that uh, where concerns have been raised is around the costs and duration um, of, of these um, uh, disputes. Um, the, the, the actual cost of running one of these disputes, although originally this was intended to be a relatively low cost alternative to other forms of dispute settlement, has actually morphed and has now become, uh, now become very, very expensive. Um, and in the view of the European Union and its member states, these three um, concerns, these three issues are interlinked. So it's very difficult to um, extract one issue from another. In our view, all three of them flow from the um, existing um, system. Um, and changing or trying to address one may not be harmful, but it's not going to resolve the generality of these of these three sets of issues that have been identified. And that takes me to the fourth point, which is the, the proposal of the European Union and its member states uh, for establishing a multilateral investment court. Now, Inge has been kind enough to include on the uh, web page of the conference um, a PowerPoint um, slides that uh, we use to, to talk through the and explain, um, in our view, the advantages of a multilateral investment court and to explain why other solutions on the table do not respond to the concerns uh, in, in the trial working group. And I'm not going to go through all of them. We don't, um, we don't have time uh, in these relatively short introductory presentations, but I would encourage you to have a look at, um, through those slides and then the links to the commission's webpage where there's, there's even more detail um, on this. But the essential idea of a multilateral investment court is to um, put in place a permanent structure for the settlement of disputes um, and to have judges appointed on a permanent basis to decide disputes. The other key part is the notion that we would have a system of appeal um, so that um, if there are errors that arise uh, in decision making, then these can be corrected. Um, so we think by creating this type of structure, you actually respond to the problems which have been identified in UNSATRAL, which I think are in general are reflective of the, the problems which were identified in the academic literature and the academic debate um, around and the policy debate around um, investment. So a permanent structure obviously deals uh, with the question of, of consistency. It, um, allows over time, of course, not immediately, but it allows over time um, for a consistent approach to be developed. Um, and we think that solves the problem that I started with of the fact that these rules exist in many other systems and are not controversial there. And um, we think the reason that they're not controversial is because um, the there is a lack of certainty, consistency, and predictability about how they um, are applied. So it, it would handle the question of consistency and predictability. It would handle the question of correctness via putting in place of a, an appeal mechanism. It would handle the concerns around um, arbitrators because um, they would be appointed on a permanent basis. So this 
uh, interaction that currently exists between uh, the appointing um, actors, which are typically law firms, um, and the arbitrators would be removed. So the arbitrators would be, uh, sorry, the adjudicators would clearly be acting um, um, independently. And we could address, if you look at the EU and its member states proposals, we would address the issues around um, diversity, um, both gender and geographical diversity in the um, uh, appointment structure. Um, and we also think that by creating such a system, by creating permanency, you would also reduce costs and you would reduce duration because a court would be better able to manage um, disputes. And there's a lot of um, very good um, analysis by Philippe Sands of this question of how arbitral tribunals are less well um, set up to manage um, uh, disputes uh, from a perspective of cost um, and, and duration. And the mere fact of providing consistency and predictability, we also think has an impact on, on reducing costs. So the number of reasons why we think a multilateral investment court makes sense. Of course, a number of challenges to be addressed in setting uh, that up. I'm not going to go into them, so I'm happy to go into that in, in, in questions and answers. Um, but we believe that these are challenges which can be, um, I'm finishing, which can be uh, addressed in the structure. And you will see in our proposals um, suggestions um, to address these in the structure. And I want to, I want to finish with my fifth uh, point which is to, to say a few words about where does Institutrial um, go? Um, so obviously the work in Institutrial, like in any other international organization has been affected by the pandemic, by the inability to meet in, in person. We have continued via uh, virtual um, meetings. Those have been useful, um, but they're, um, clearly there are no replacement for physical meetings. So hopefully we get back soon um, to, to physical meetings. Um, and the, the working group has set itself uh, a target of 2025-2026 to finish um, all of its uh, work. So there's now we're now moving to more detailed work on um, on text. I think the the interesting thing about Institutrial is also that it is triggered, and I think this goes a bit to some of the points that Professor Sonraja was making. It triggers a more general debate on the regime overall. I, to me, there are two things that is triggered that are extremely important and we need to see how they, how they develop. One is it is it has triggered the question of how do the, the dispute settlement mechanism fit with the rule makers? And I think also Yarek picked up on this point that there is a, at the moment there's a divide, complete divide and isolation between the dispute settlement mechanisms and the rule makers. Um, I think that that is going to be put into question and, and looked at again as part of the Institute process. The other thing that is happening is there are questions about how do developing countries and least developed countries fit in the system. Um, and that is leading to a discussion on the creation of an advisory center and other ways to, to try to facilitate and, and help developing countries navigate um, in the system. So I think what is extremely interesting about Institutrial is not just its impact in terms of reform of dispute settlement, but also how those reforms then impact into um, uh, other, uh, other parts of the investment uh, treaty regime. And with that, I'll stop. Um, I'm happy, of course, to continue the discussion afterwards. Thank you very much. Thank you, Colin, very much for a very structured and informative uh, overview of uh, the problems within the system and also the, the solutions that the uh, EU is uh, trying to, to achieve. And uh, now I, uh, I would like to invite talented Dr. Krina Baltag uh, to hear her presentation. She is a senior uh, lecturer in international arbitration at Stockholm University and qualified lawyer since 2004. She is an author of a number of books on the energy aspects, uh, on the exit, on uh, uh, future of investment arbitration, and uh, she's an editor and uh, heavily involved in the other aspects of the publication. Uh, not mentioning many degrees that she has and uh, 
um, acting as an arbitrator in a number of um, cases under different institutional rules. Uh, and uh, Krina uh, will give an uh, overview of, of the, um, also you know, from her perspective of, of the system and will focus in particular on alternative dispute resolution, including mediation in investment disputes. Krina? Thank you very much, Inga, and thank you to the University of Vilnius for uh, this wonderful conference. And uh, I appreciate uh, uh, the challenge of following uh, uh, such great presentations, uh, and uh, in particular, uh, hearing from uh, Professor Sornaraja how the MIC should be approached with caution, and uh, Yarik uh, uh, presenting uh, uh, the divide public-private, and here we are in the middle, uh, but everything it's adjudication. And of course, Colin referred to dysfunctions of the system of dispute settlement, and then alluded, of course, to something that I'll touch upon uh, in, in a few minutes, which is the advisory center proposed under the UNCITRAL. So my presentation will focus on exactly what was not addressed so far. What, what is out there that could serve uh, perhaps the reform of ISDS? Um, and this would be alternative dispute resolution mechanisms. So alternative to adjudication, one would say. Um, although I would use the term appropriate dispute resolution mechanism if we want to uh, give credit to the fact that uh, in particular investment disputes have their peculiarities and one should probably choose what is uh, adequate uh, in settling that dispute. Uh, so the first part of my uh, presentation will focus on ADR and how that would that is approach uh, within the UNSTRA working group free discussions. And then I'll turn to the proposed advisory center, which takes some of the elements of the ADR proposals and integrates them. And we have a new uh, working paper released by the UNSTRA working group free, which is still uh, open for comments, I think, until the end of the month. So you find it on the website. Uh, it's quite a lengthy paper uh, with an annex as well, which shows how this advisory center will be financed. Uh, and I think that's an interesting question. So on the first part on, on mediation or ADR in general, uh, the, the first question is, why are we discussing uh, this uh, in the context of investment arbitration? And of course, the answer is, among others, uh, other reasons, the UNCITRAL Working Group uh, 3, uh, uh, among the solutions put uh, on the table, has dispute prevention and mitigation and means of alternative dispute resolution. And this comes after the states have identified the need to further explore mediation, conciliation, and other alternatives to both arbitration and national courts. And from the various advantage, and obviously uh, we had a lot of discussions in the in the Mutsutra Working Group Free and the papers submitted by the states, but uh, I would highlight some of the advantages uh, pointed out by states for mediation. Less time and cost intensive, uh, having a high degree of flexibility and authority for the disputing parties, preserving long-term relationship. And I think this is uh, quite relevant for foreign investors and in the context of investment uh, uh, um, law. Um, and also clarifying the interests of the disputing parties uh, and giving more focus to the decisions. So rather than focusing, locking ourselves in the positions, we try to see what are the real interests. And the other submission from the parties uh, in connection with the, um, the advantages that this mechanism would have uh, was that specific rules for investment disputes um, should be implemented. So not general, but specific, taking into consideration the specificities of this uh, type of disputes. Now, that's the discussion in the working group three. Uh, the question, the second question is, what is the current state of affairs? Where are we? And uh, why can't we use what we have for uh, in, uh, any reform uh, in, this, uh, in this sense? I will not go, uh, Professor Sornaraja gave a great account and Colin as well of the origins of the system. Um, we all know that um, uh, the president of the World Bank uh, 
uh, before the setup of the ICSID uh, uh, had uh, um, uh, offering the good offices uh, in the context of various disputes involving investments from the World Bank. And this is one of the reasons why uh, the ICSID project uh, has commenced. So I'll not go there, but uh, what do we have in terms of regulatory framework uh, with respect to this ADR mechanism? And of course, the treaties, uh, uh, over 3,000 uh, international investment agreements, now less. Um, from the ones mapped by the UNCTAD, uh, if one wants to look at the website, uh, we can see that about 600 have uh, voluntary ADR and some, uh, a, a bit more, uh, about 70% would provide for some sort of cooling off periods. And I'll not insist on cooling off periods. Uh, I'm sure that everybody is aware of this, that three, six or more months that uh, an investor has to give to the state to be able to negotiate an amicable settlement. Um, and in reality, it's, uh, while it is a formality, which uh, in, in the practice of the arbitral tribunals is uh, regarded either as a condition of admissibility or jurisdiction or something in between, the reality is that the schooling off periods are simply on the paper. Uh, we see also the new international investment agreements, uh, which have more detailed uh, provisions on ADR. And of course, the European Union free trade agreements, uh, also CPTPP, where you have the first tier of ADR, and then you move um, and, and quite structure. On, and I'll refer to, to some of the treaties and then the second tier with arbitration and litigation. And if we want to go a bit more specific in the regulatory framework, we have, of course, the exit conciliation, the exit conciliation rules as early as uh, 1967. We have the new uh, the amendment process of the exit uh, rules with a proposal of having mediation rules for investment disputes. We have the 2012 IBA ad hoc rules for investor state mediation. And I, from, from my research, I understand that uh, have been used once at least uh, um, for a mediation of an investment dispute. We have, of course, the efforts of uh, the Energy Charter Conference in the context of the Energy Charter Treaty to implement um, mediation rules for, uh, in, for a guide for investment mediation for the Energy Charter Treaty disputes, and so on and so forth. Uh, in terms of how this is reflected in practice, I mentioned that the cooling off period is probably uh, more on the paper than in practice, but of course, uh, given the nature of this uh, dispute resolution mechanism, uh, less transparent and based on party autonomy, uh, it's difficult to have uh, meaningful and transparent statistics on whether parties, uh, investors and state would choose to go and actually uh, uh, succeed in reaching a settlement agreement. So. Um, less statistics, but we can look at the exit conciliation proceedings, and uh, one can notice that uh, only 13 conciliations in, uh, in the life of the exit, and most of them are coming by way of uh, um, contractual provisions, so clauses in contracts, most of them concession contracts, and uh, most of them would proceed to arbitration, so unsuccessful conciliation. But we also see in the exit statistics that about 35% of the cases are settled or discontinued. So that's another point. Uh, of course, different, uh, st different cases uh, or, or accounts of uh, mediation of uh, investor state disputes emerge from now, from time to time. Uh, I'm aware of one ICC, I mentioned the one IBA ad hoc rules for investment investor state mediation. So the third question is, why is not ADR or mediation used? Obviously, there is some regulatory framework, but in practice, uh, not that much used. And I will not, it's, it's a very long debate, subject to probably a dedicated panel, but I would mention two, um, let's say, obstacles. The first one that comes from uh, the national legislation, and the second one, other let's say more non-legal policy, uh, maybe obstacles. From the national legislation of states, obviously uh, the state governance um, and the, the, the fact that it's very difficult to make a payment without a complex decision. Uh, perhaps there's no process for the approval of uh, such settlement, payment of deriving from a settlement. 
of course, national legislation with the, with inherent limitations, like who is going to negotiate on behalf of the state, or maybe states are not even allowed to negotiate. Um, so these are these are important limitation. Some of them raised in the UNSTRA working group three, uh, but definitely to be taken into consideration in the future. And the third, uh, the second type of concerns, non-legal ones. Of course, we have uh, the civil society concerns, and already we're in a system that is uh, less transparent than the public adjudicatory system. Um, uh, how would uh, the public interest be represented in this uh, mediation, for example, proceedings? Um, there are other uh, reasons, the fear to set a precedent, uh, the fear of public criticism and so on. Uh, so these are, these are also obstacles. And one might understand why ADR is not that much used for ISDS. And the fourth question, what is next? Um, in the working group three, uh, of course, um, as Colin was mentioning, where we, we have until 2000, 20, 2026 to discuss all these reform options. And, and of course, the, the first important step is to see how to address these difficulties that I mentioned. For example, consent of the parties, should we have mandatory mediation? What is the time frame for this uh, process? Uh, transparency versus confidentiality. Um, we have um, the um, one important aspect: where is to be conducted, uh, where to conduct the mediation. And I was referring to the uh, EU free trade agreements. For example, the Vietnam one in the Annex Nine uh, uh, to the Investment Protection Agreement provides that the mediation should be held in the territory of the respondent state or as agreed. So there are certain elements that should be considered um, in, in, uh, in proceeding with any proposal for, for example, a special set of rules for mediation. And of course, the second point is how to incentivize mediation and ADR. And I think this comes a lot from raising awareness about this mechanism, but at the same time, as I mentioned, implementing at national level legislation that would allow states to actually engage in this process. And also with the view of to, to the future, the second part of, uh, of, uh, of my presentation that is focused on the advisory center, uh, and I'll refer briefly to this, it takes some elements of, of uh, the ADR mechanism and try to uh, integrate them in this proposed advisory center. We have to remember that these reform options are being discussed and a uh, proposal are put forward uh, by the secretariat. So what we have before us, obviously it's a great, at this stage, a great paper um, to commence discussions and state to um, adopt whatever is suitable to them. Uh, in, in, in a nutshell, the advisory center that is proposed by the UNC trial working group free reform uh, has, would offer five types of services. The first one would be pre-dispute and dispute avoidance services. And the second one, mediation and other alternative dispute resolution methods. So you can see how it's linked to the, to the other reform option uh, that I discussed. Now on this too, obviously um, it, is, it will act as a platform of, uh, of uh, sharing best practices and it will provide assistance uh, um, for prevention of the escalation of disputes to states. Uh, but the proposal on the mediation is actually for the advisory center to function as a mediation institute. Um, and here is probably where, where I would have uh, a, a, some concern, uh, if not a great concern, because the role of a mediation institute uh, has to be separated or, or uh, fenced, I would say, uh, against the other services offered by the advisory center, such as the third one, which is defense services, which are uh, basically support offered to states uh, when already the dispute has escalated and is submitted to uh, one of the adjudicatory dispute resolution mechanisms. Um, the fourth one, the fourth service is legal and policy advisory services, 
uh, is more focused on um, the negotiation of the treaties and the policies of the state with respect to investment uh, law and um, adjudication or ISDS. And the fifth one is capacity building and sharing of best practices. So there are different types of services. And uh, from my point of view, some would, be, would have to be looked carefully at because they might not work well together, or at least the perception of the outside world would not be the best by mixing everything together uh, in one center. Um, the last point um, is the, who is going to benefit from the advisory center. Right? And uh, here we had uh, quite a strong debate in the work, working group three, uh, whether states, states and investors, what states, and the, the current draft of, uh, on the advisory center says that the least developed states or less developed states and developing states would benefit from um, uh, the first three services that I mentioned, pre-dispute and dispute avoidance services, mediation and ADR, and defense services, as well as uh, the, four, the fourth and the fifth. So all five, basically, uh, including legal, legal and policy advisory services and capacity building. Developed countries and small and medium uh, enterprises would only benefit from the fourth and fifth that is legal and policy advisory services and capacity building. Um, now, I will not get into the, whether that should be the case, but obviously this takes us back to what Professor Sonaraja was saying about the balance in the system, whether now we're tilting the, uh, um, the scale in favor of the states, rather trying to find a balance or a middle ground. Um, but again, as I said, this is just a proposal paper, and we, we, we know from the discussion in the working group three that we're a long way from uh, finding the perfect shape for this advisory center. Um, I would stop here, and uh, I would uh, be happy to answer any questions. Thank you very much, Inga. Thank you very much, Krina. I, uh, I'm, I'm very briefly, I'm looking at the chat of any questions. 